thank you all for coming out tonight and coming inside on such a beautiful evening. Um, I appreciate you being here. I've talked a lot about horses, I lecture about horses all the time, so this is something slightly different. So in putting this story together, I've drawn from my own experience and some things I don't know much about and a little bit of personal experience. I'm going to weave it all in together to tell you a story about how horses have interacted with the building of this country. If, I, if you can't hear me at the back, just wave and I'll speak up a bit. Um, there's two themes to the story. One is first that horses evolved in North America, including Canada. So this country, even before it was a country, when it was just a landmass, was part a uh, party to building the horses themselves, and I'll talk a bit about that. But once the horses were built, we as humans used them to build the nation. And in doing so, we also rebuilt the horse to make it serve us better. And I'll show you that sort of cycle as one of the themes of this talk. The other theme is we're, we're, we're going to be like time-traveling butterflies. We're going to flit through time and place and land on a lot of different little flowers. And I'm going to tell you a story about lots of different flowers. And at the end, I'm hoping you'll be able to see the whole garden. But we're, we're just going to do this very piecemeal in little pieces. But hopefully the whole story will come out. We're going to start by zipping through 50 million years, just like one does, zip. Um, because that's how long it took to evolve horses from their first ancestors, or earliest horse-like ancestors. Then we're going to jump around to uh, come much more recent, 13,000 years ago, um, when horses were interacting with early humans on the continent. Then we'll jump forward to the pre-confederation pre years and talk a bit about them. And uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk a bit about them and then spend a bit more time on the post-confederation years when horses really came into their own, as Val said, as the engines that drove a lot of the opening up and development of Canada. So we're going to be jumping around in place too, mostly in North America, but at the end w the words whole world are put in there in bright orange, just to emphasise that all the uses, the ways that we as humans have used horses historically in building our civilization and earlier civilizations, are basically in use now. So if you travel worldwide, you will see horses doing exactly some of the things I'm going to be talking about, even though we, we in North America are much less familiar with those. So there's our pathway, just jumping around in time, uh, space and time. So, <coughs> A little bit of biomechanics for all of you enthusiasts of biomechanics. What makes horses useful? This is one thing that makes horses useful. Just, yeah, I've got the other two. Their resemblance to a hammer. If you imagine this as a horse's leg, and this horse happens to have a very big heavy foot, and you try and swing that leg backwards and forwards while you're moving, it takes a fair amount of energy because of the weight at the bottom. But if you simply put the weight at the top, all of a sudden that becomes really easy to move. And so if you look at horse anatomy, we'll come back to springs in a minute, horse anatomy resembles very strongly the design of a hammer in that the shaft of the hammer, the skinny legs of the shaft, long and slender, very light for moving, but all the big heavy muscles that drive that motion are not at the bottom, but they're at the top. So all the weight of the leg is up the top, which is where you'd expect it, around the limb. So these, uh, I, was, I did very deliberately spared you pictures of real anatomy because it gets a bit gruesome. But these are where all the big muscles are that drive the legs. As you can see, they're tucked right up on the body, so to bring the head of the hammer right to the top. And that makes their motion very energy efficient. That's part one. Here we see a wonderful horse, race horse of the 1970s. Um, here's his long, skinny hammer shaft legs. Look at the mass of muscle driving that hind leg. Look at the mass of muscle in here driving the foreleg. All the muscle, the weight of the animal is up at the top in the body. And that makes a big difference to its energy when it's running. So how about springs? <coughs> 
Little experiment. This is for you to do here now, not even at home. Put your hand out. Put these fingers on your forearm, those of you who want. Hold, just hold your forearm gently. Now wiggle these fingers. And what these fingers should be feeling is your muscles moving underneath. Okay, you can stop now. <laughs> okay, good. And what that tells you is the muscles are up here and there's tendons that run down into the fingers. And what the horse done, does is turn that apparatus upside down and bounce off those tendons like great big springs. So if you look at horse anatomy, especially around this fetlock joint, here's the muscles. These are the horse's version of the muscles we would just caressing gently. Um, there are the big long tendons. And they are really big thick tendons in a horse. They store a lot of energy. And when the animal is moving, let's see if this is going to behave. Ooh, press go. There we go. If you watch this joint down here, you can see it bend as weight is put on it, then straighten again. When it's bending, it's storing energy, and then it's returning energy to the horse. It's the equivalent of you buying a car that is 20% more efficient. So horses are 20% more efficient with the springs than without. And that's one of their secrets to success as a very mobile animal, is being very efficient about it. If we look a bit further, we find even more springs. Everywhere in horse anatomy there's springs. All these yellow lines are ligaments and tendons that ha are very springy. And here's a very special one right here. This is the biceps. This is our biceps that we use for lifting. Our biceps has a tendon at each end and muscle in the middle. What the horse does is stretch the tendon right through the middle. So it can still act as a muscle, but it can also act as a spring. And when the animal's leg is coming backwards as it's pushing itself forwards, as the leg comes backwards, this joint straightens out, stretches the spring, and as soon as the foot comes off the ground, the spring catapults the leg forward again. So it doesn't have to contract the muscle to do that. So it's saving an awful lot of energy. And as you can see, I won't go into all of them, but, but you can see by the yellow lines, there's springs all over the place. They're very spring-driven, if you like. And what this does is build the animal, the horse as a generic animal for speed because its legs can carry it very fast and that's very good for getting away from lions not that there's many around here but originally it would have been good for getting away from lions and predators it gives them stamina for migrating long distances which they the zebras in the wild <coughs> still do that and also it allows them to stand uh, or sleep while they're standing um, but that's neither here nor there for this. But because um, the very large muscles that are driving the leg are very powerful, it also gives them abil the ability to produce a lot of traction. They can, they're suited, obviously they don't do it in the wild, but they are suited for being able to pull things because they're strong. And because they're strong, they can also carry things. So if you put the speed and the stamina and the traction and the carrying together, that ma makes them a pretty useful animal for our use and we've discovered many ways to use them. The title of this talk has the words horsepower in it. What is horsepower? Horsepower is a technical term invented by or devised by James Watt, famous f early physicist, to compare what were then the new steam engines, this is Watt's steam engine, with the draft horses that pulled plows and carriages. And he did some calculations and came up with what he thought would be one horsepower, the, the power that a horse could generate. And farmers, later farmers who didn't know about Watt's design or Watt's calculations, worked out for themselves empirically that if you've got a 1,600 pound horse, and that would be a 1,600 pound horse, it can pull between one seventh and one tenth of its body weight continuously for 10 hours, and then it will need a rest. But that's pulling a 160 pound load behind you for 10 hours. Right? Humans can't do that, not very easily. Um, and that turns out to be one horsepower. So what was able to calculate how much better or worse his steam engines were than horses. And his early steam engines were not much better than horses, the later ones were. Especially when 
in short distances, horses can actually generate 14 horsepower. So they're very strong, they're very powerful. So far, so good. That's enough of all the really technical stuff. Now we're going to go look at where this, all this anatomy came from. We're going to look a bit at the evolution of horses. Um, this picture is very near and dear to me because I used to pass it every day going to the museum where I was working as a grad student. Um, it's no longer there, unfortunately. But it shows the evolution of horses. Here's modern horses over here, horse and a pony. And this is the earliest known forerunner, a um, thing called uh, the Dawn Horse, or Hyracotherium. And it was a little animal that ran around in forests. It ate leaves. It was probably very agile, but it was very much a forest creature, a, gr a, brow uh, sorry. Yeah, a browser. Um, when the prairies opened up in the American, North American Midwest, it gradually evolved over many millions of years into animals that were grazers and migratory, sort of like horses are now. This is a different way of saying exactly the same thing. Here's our little browsing animal. Here's many years of grazing animals and when the prairies really open up, there are at one time as many different types of horses as there are cloven-foot animals now. So if you think of deer and giraffe and antelope and gazelles and llamas, many, many types of cloven-foot animals, there used to be that many horses. We're, but we're talking 15 million years ago. And only in the last 3 million years do you actually get what we know as horses today. And all of this, this is relevant to Canada because all of this happened in North America. So Canada helped to build the horse. Okay. And then roughly 11,000 years ago, all of a sudden horses disappear from North America. We don't know why but for a 10 or 11,000 year period, there just weren't any in North America. But fortunately, in that period, some of them had migrated over to Europe and Asia across the Bering Land Bridge. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, during this time, the animal was changing greatly in its body form. All those springs were developing and various other changes were going on in the legs. I showed you the hammer, saying you don't want a heavy foot at the bottom. Well, initially they had three toes on the feet. So as the animal got bigger and became more of a prairie animal and started using its tendons as springs, those toes eventually, or slowly regress, and eventually in the modern horse, they're pretty much gone. Those of you who know horse anatomy and know the splint bones, that's all that's left of them. But essentially it's now only got one toe. So over its evolutionary time, it lost toes. Very careless of it, but it was useful. Um, the timing of this, the, the reason this graph shows 50 million years is because all of these anatomical changes didn't happen overnight. Evolution doesn't work that way. So hooves, where's the word hoof? I can't even see it. Oh, here we go, hoof. Hooves are actually donated to the horse line by their own ancestors. So hooves have been developed before horses even appear on the scene. And the long skinny legs start appearing in their ancestors. So even this guy had hooves and long skinny legs. But it didn't stand on tiptoe and use its tendons as, as springs until many millions of years later. And then a few million years later, it finally lost all its extra toes. So all these things take a long time to evolve. Okay, with that part of the story, any questions? No? Good. Let's move along. Now we're going to jump time and place. We're coming up to the very top of the North American continent, actually to Alaska, but Alaska should really be part of Canada, so we'll call it part of Canada. Um, and this is about 17,000 years ago. And here is a fossil hoof, well preserved in the, the, the um, shale on the side of the Titilat River in northern Alaska. And this is the top view. It's, a, it's squished side to side, which is what makes it look weird. It's, so you imagine this flattened out, which is where you get this view. But here's the bone inside it. Here's the piece of bone that you can see projecting out. On the sides, it's worn just like modern hooves wear. And the only strange thing about it is this very straight line across here that you see in several views. And this 
basically indicates that the animal was pawing at the ground using its hoof like a shovel and wearing off the tip of the toe. Tip of the toe would normally look round, this is not a brilliant one, but would normally look rounded, not straight. So you can imagine this poor animal in the, the cold, almost Siberian-like north, um, pouring at the ground, trying to get at mosses and things underneath the snow. No humans around at that point, not in that part of the world. But there were humans here, in southern Alberta, about 13,000 years ago, a place called Wally's Beach. The, this, this site where these bones were found is actually on Wally's Beach campground in Alberta, someone just south of Lethbridge. And what was found there, I don't know who found them, but were seven butchered horses, along with stone implements, which is what you, was used to butcher them, marks from the stones are left on the bones. So these animals were caught, slaughtered and eaten. So horse meat was part of the diet of the um, early humans who lived in this area about 13,000 years ago. And it's thought that these are Clovis people because the tools they used are very similar to Clovis tools, though this date is apparently a little bit early. Um, Jim Burns' story is simply that Jim Burns is a friend of mine from way back who's now at the um, Provincial Museum in Ed Edmonton, Alberta. When he was here as a grad student, he went to a conservation area for an event much like this, but what he was demonstrating, not talking about, was how to skin animals much the way the Clovis people did. So he had to skin half a deer with a steel knife, a modern knife, and half a, half a deer, the other half of the deer, with one of these things. And there was a local guy actually making them for him on the spot, chipping away at the stones. And he said the steel knife started off sharper, but the stone knives held their sharpness much, much longer, and he actually preferred the stone knife for skinning. Sorry, lost where I'm going. There we go. I'm going to give you lots of trivial details, but, so, but do try and remember the story as well as them. So now we're jumping forward again. We're now jumping to 1500, 1600 um, AD, somewhere in that hundred year, that century, which is when horses started coming to the New World. But the point I want to make from this slide is that all the uses of horses that we're going to see had been used in the New World, uh, sorry, in the Old World, in Europe and Asia for many years. Their civilizations historically were built using horses, either for riding and warfare, this is obviously a modern picture, these are actors, um, or for pulling things, whether they're chariots or farm implements, or for sport things like racing. All that had been developed by many civilizations over time in Europe and Asia. All that was necessary to use the horse to open up Canada was to import horses to Canada. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Not quite so easy. Canadian terrain gives horses problems for two reasons. One, there's lots of water, there's lots of swamp, there's lots of forest. Horses do not do well in any of these. Here we go, water, there's a bit of swamp with a moose in it, lots of forest behind. Also, seasonally, you get this once a year um, deep soft snow and 200 years ago, they had a series of cold winters that left a lot of snow. Horses are fine once you've packed the snow down, but while the snow is deep and soft, it's like you trying to go through deep snow without snowshoes. Right? So horses don't have a good time with either of these. So just bringing horses over and expecting to import the technology that goes with them was not a good idea. And just to emphasize the point, here is a horse with its small hoof, and it tends to swing its leg fairly straight with very little ground clearance. But if that's swamp or marsh, sorry, I'm just going to make that work. Is it going? There we go. You can see the legs going quite straight, and that small hoof is going to drive into swamp or snow, and the animal's going to have a rough time moving. On the other hand, Native animals, such as our moose, look how high it's lifting those back legs. It's a very different motion. It's clearly not in a swamp, but you get the idea. And moose moves, and look at the way it's bouncing, it's, all, it's prancing. And that's what gets them through the, the swamps and the forests and the marshes. Okay. 
Uh, so you think, okay, why not hitch moose to our plows? Well, your plows would be disappearing over the horizon <laughs> and you'll be saying, come back moose, they don't train very well. Um, so we still, we still have the problem of horses. That didn't stop people bringing horses to the New World. And some early horse imports, the Sun King of France, when, Fra when the east part of the East Coast was being opened up as the supposed New France, the Sun King sent about 80 horses. And these were fairly elite horses. They were no Norman Spanish, Spanish Arab crosses used for riding and for warfare by the French. Um, and they are still around, at least some of their genes are still around in the Canadian breed of horse. So three or four hundred years later, these horses are still represented in Canada. But these horses did not open up the whole of Canada. They were used very exclusively um, on the East Coast, maybe as far in as Montreal, down, down the uh, St. Lawrence. Jump a hundred years, Plains of Abraham is well recorded that the French army had a very elite uh, corps of cavalry, about 200 horses worth, and the British were mainly infantry and um, artillery, and the only people on horses were the officers, so maybe half a dozen horses, or a dozen horses, whatever. Um, we still know who won, but what I'm saying is there were horses, in, even in 1759, there were horses in use in Canada. Most of the, a lot of the reason, not most, but a lot of the reason that the East Coast was not opened up so as quick as it might have been is because these two nations spent a lot of time haggling about who was going to take it over and instead of opening it up they fought each other. It's like um, small children not playing well in the same sandpit. But, um, but eventually we get beyond that and this is a very rough outline of the situation in Canada in about 1700. So we're slowly coming forward in time. The British and the French had control of these two parts and seeing how small the British part is, you wonder why Britain ven eventually opened up the whole of Canada, but that's another story altogether. But look who gets deeded most of the land. It's the hunters and trappers, Hudson's Bay Company and their fur, um, fur trapping business got deeded all of that land. It was called Rupert's Land, and it's, a, it's literally half of Canada. So it wasn't a nation, it was just land deeded by the two countries to the company. It was company land. But because of the terrain, horses would be confined to settlements along the St. Lawrence and, and within 100 miles of the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes, because obviously um, Fort York was being developed about that time. But most of this land was not traversed by horse at all. It was traversed by people in canoes, either paddling them or carrying them. Horses really did not make big inroads onto this country for quite a few years yet. There were some out here in this area, and these were remnants of Spanish horses. Horses had disappeared in North America before humans came along, mostly, um, but the Spanish reintroduced them, but they were much further south. But the horses that they released into the wild or escaped started settling on the prairies, which they were well adapted to. That's where their ancestors had come from. So they would have come up here, and, and most of the uh, Western Prairie tribes in Canada, they would have been Cree and Blackfoot, um, had horses, which they didn't use for agriculture, but mainly for transport. And you've seen, I don't have a picture, but um, First Nations people with those travois, the, the fork sticks on the back of the horse, and their tent riding on, on the back. That was the, the biggest use. Um, and to some extent, hunting as well. So hunting and transport was what the horses were used for. But this area was more or less devoid of horses to any great degree. And horses, as it says over there, took a very secondary role for about 150 years to travel by water. So they're not part of the picture till coming up to Confederation times. But coming up to Confederation times, Canada is being opened up in different ways. Waterways are being developed into canal systems, so you no longer have to portage your canoe. You can bring big ships all the way across the Great Lakes and up the major rivers. Roads are being developed, 
slowly but surely. They wouldn't have been lovely roads to start with, but there were lots of them, and they connected all the major cities at that time. And rail came in, late 1800s, rail comes in. And those are the things that opened up Canada, with travel by waterways, rail, and roads. But once you've got roads, you can start using horses. And all of a sudden, horse num not all of a sudden, but fairly quickly, horse both numbers and uses increased substantially to, to aid the opening up of the country. So some numbers. Um, unfortunately, the, the numbers don't go back very far. People weren't doing censuses at that time. But by 1891, there were 1.5 million horses. 30 years later, no, sorry, 20 years later, that had almost doubled to 2.9 million. And that compare, this is in the whole country, and that compares with roughly 900,000 in 2010. So it's gone back down, but there's still a substantial number of horses here. This point is to make the point that the horses were here to be used. So if they were in Canada, most of them stayed in Canada. Exporting cattle and exporting grain became big in industries, but exporting horses was a relatively minor thing. They weren't an agricultural export to any great extent. Um, they were here for use. And here are some of the uses that they were put to. And I can let you read the list briefly, but I'm going to give you an example of some of them in a minute. But all of these are areas that were necessary to open up the country and to develop the economy of the country, and they're all areas in which horses participated extensively. So we've got this very versatile animal. <coughs> and one of the aspects of making it more useful was to breed it selectively so you could change the shape of it for whatever use you wanted. So some of the purebred breeds, like the thoroughbred, were produced primarily for riding and for racing. And a lot of these were exported um, because people coming from Europe realizing they could breed here and ship the horses back and make some money doing it. But for local use, the standard bread became, was one breed that became very, very popular because it was a rugged horse. It still is. Uh, standard breads I've worked around quite a bit. They're lovely horses, but they're ornery. And they're a little mule-like. If they want to go, you're not stopping them. Um, but for Pulling things and general light to medium work, they're wonderful animals. And for some reason, um, they're, they're very good for pulling. For some reason, driving horses with little buggies was a lot more popular way of getting around in North America than in Europe. In Europe, most people rode if they had a horse, if they wanted to go from A to B. North America, you'd hitch, hitch the horse to the buggy and off you'd go. And these are great for pulling buggies. And then if you wanted heavy work, several... Um, heavy horse breeds. You've seen the um, pictures, I think most of you might have seen pictures of the Budweiser horses and similar um, large heavy pulling horses. So if you're going to use horses for pulling, why not use cows? Cows are stronger and indeed many farmers used cows for pulling heavy loads but they only moved slowly. Um, there used to be two roads in 1850 going from Toronto to Owen Sound. One was the, the stagecoach road, and if you were on the stagecoach, it would take you two very long days to get from Toronto to Owen Sound. Now it takes about three hours. If you were on the cattle road, it would take you six days, because cattle just move slowly. But on the other hand, you'd be pulling 2,000 pounds of goods behind you, because the cattle are strong. But cattle are also less trainable. If you've got a cow pulling a plough and the plough gets stuck behind a stone, the cows just keep going. If it breaks the plough too bad, they don't care. Horses will stop. So cattle are used, but horses are more versatile. And here's the word versatile. They're also ubiquitous. And the whole point of this slide, and thanks to Kathleen of this museum for giving me all these pictures, or providing me with the pictures, is to show you that if you sit for a minute and think, OK, where do I see cars nowadays? Where do, days, where do I see trucks, pickup trucks? Where do I see large uh, semis? You see them all over the place. They're all doing different jobs, but you cannot travel anywhere without seeing a car, a truck, or a semi. 
in these times, these were the cars, the trucks, and the semis. And they were all over the place. So they were used for everything that we would use a vehicle for nowadays. So for driving, here's a nice little buggy. Farming, um, I couldn't find a horse with a plough, but these horses would have been used to plough and thresh and bring in the hay, all, all sorts of uses. Heavy haulage, you can see these nice big horses. Street cleaning, you can't see the horse, but one consequence of using horses was that the streets needed cleaning quite frequently. <laughs> so this is a water truck in about 1880, I believe, um, with a horse in front of it, and it is a 1880s version of a street cleaner. This is the McDonald Stewart Art Gallery. It used to be the school at the top of the hill, up on the top of Gordon. And this is my wife in the school bus, because she went there. <laughs> I'm joking, sorry about that. I'm going to get whacked when I get home now, yeah. But no, this was the school bus, again in the early 1900s, probably. Um, delivery, all deliveries done by horses. Military, here's a two sets of cannon being pulled by horses and the gunners riding the horses themselves. So everywhere you see vehicles now, you once saw horses. And don't forget winter, horses in winter. So this is an early horse-driven snowplow. And the problem with that is that horses, when they're opening up a road, still have to walk through the packed snow. So they're not having a good time of it. Um, this, this is the horse, this is a horse-driven cart being loaded with snow in Young Street in 1922. And staying with winter, if you were out in the woods and you wanted to beat a trail, you'd put snowshoes on your horses and get them to walk up and down it several times. And once it was packed down, it was much more useful. And then, strangest of all, this looks like a Christmas card, but this is actually a real stagecoach put on skis. It was a, a stagecoach sled that plied out of Montreal as far as the East Coast in the late 1800s. I don't know how express it was, but as, in term, in, compared to a cattle cart, it would have been quite speedy. So. so other uses of horses. Let's look at some uses. Once the rails came in, they were wonderful for carrying many, many tons of goods either way, distributing them from the sea into the inland or crops and other products going back from inland back to the sea. But have you ever tried driving? Oh, can I give you a quick joke? There's a man traveling on a train, and all of a sudden, all heck breaks loose. Everything, the train's bouncing all over, and eventually it quietens down again. And then the conductor comes, the engine, the conductor comes by, and the man says, Why was the train bouncing around so much? And the guy said, Oh, unfortunately, we hit a rabbit. And the guy said, well, why was the train bouncing around so much? We had to chase it across the field. <laughs> um, which makes the point that trains do not leave the tracks usually. So if you want to distribute the goods from this train, you need horses. So all of these bright spots here are, this is obviously from space, a very recent photograph, but this shows you where the population density areas are in North America. So all of these areas would have been serviced by rail, but if you wanted to get stuff out into the less populated areas, you needed horses, because they were the distribution system. And this is a very late, this is 1951, this is a distribution for milk, this is how milk was delivered in Guelph in 1951. Okay. So distribution, one really important use for horses. Farming and ranching, I'm going to go over a few minutes, I should warn you, I'm supposed to do 40 minutes, I'm going to go over a little bit. Um, this is another satellite picture showing the fluorescence uh, made by plants while they're growing in July. So this is the agricultural area of North America. Obviously, the U.S. Corn Belt is the most dense, but look at the prairies and look through Quebec and in, into Ontario. So these are the prime agricultural areas in Canada, shown up very nicely. The first commercial farm on the prairies in Manitoba, right about here, was established in 1812, so well before Confederation. And it had a problem because it had cattle on the farm as well as um, crops being grown, but the cattle were grazed on land that the Métis 
used for um, grazing their or yeah grazing their horses that they used for buffalo hunting. So there was a conflict between the farmers and the hunters. Unfortunately for the Métis, that problem went away in the late 1800s because the buffalo were absolutely decimated. That's another whole story. But the buffalo disappeared, which gave later governments the, the problem of feeding the First Nations people who had depended on them for their living. And part of that was done with farming, and farming is what was coming to the prairies. Um, before we get to farming, hang on a sec, yeah. Ranching. The east, sorry, the west opened up um, in the late 1800s to ranching. And this was the area that was um, populated by Blackfeet and Cree tribes who used horses for hunting and moving. But when the whites, mainly Europeans, um, came in here, they realized that they could use the horses and, and the land for ranching. And in 1881, thanks to Sir John A. MacDonald, you could lease up to 100,000 acres of land here for a dollar, uh, sorry, a cent per acre per year. Put a few thousand cattle on that. Can you imagine the profit margin on that? Um, and all of a sudden, there's a few extremely large ranches in this area. To some extent, they competed with the indigenous people. To some extent, they used them because the indigenous people had the know-how on how to break and train horses for domestic use. They were, they were handlers, horse handlers, um, over many generations. So they, they became quite useful. Uh, one farm, one ranch, these large ones, bred thoroughbred horses for the famous corn hunt in England. Um, you probably haven't heard of the corn hunt, and the only reason I'm mentioning it, mentioning it is because I went to school about five miles away from where it is. But this was a, a strange use. Most of the, the ranches were cattle, breeding cattle. This one bred horses. But in the late 1800s, uh, there were a number of winters that killed off a lot of the short grass, and some ranches were literally killed off overnight because the cattle had no fodder not overnight, over winter, over a few winters. And once the ranchers moved away, farmers moved in. So there was this swing, and it, it didn't happen in one move, and it didn't happen overnight, but there was this swing in the late 1800s from ranching in these prairie areas, which obviously is really big in the, the southern parts of the US. It had its heyday here, and then it died out, and the swing was to farming. While the ranchers were there, um, because the West was wild, the Northwest Mounted Police were founded to police it. And they initially were like little cavalry platoons. So if you've ever seen a John Wayne movie where he's saying, troops ho, and he's leading his troops out of the, out of the um, stockade, this is what the, the Mounties were like in the late 1800s, policing the prairies. In 1920, they became motorized and shortly after that gave up the use of horses in active duty, but they're still represented in the musical ride. And all the horses have to be black. They've always had to be black for some tradition I do not know. Um, my friend Malcolm, an ex-RCMP officer, was invited to participate in a parade in, when he was still serving, in a parade in some town in Ontario. And when he showed up, they said, instead of marching in in all your red regalia, why don't we put you on a horse? He'd never ridden a horse in his life, but <laughs> they persuaded him. Somebody took a picture and it got in the paper of him on this horse, the Mountie on his horse, and his senior officer chewed him out because it wasn't a black horse. Mm. So they were very strict on their black horses. There's still some active independent mounted units. Toronto obviously has a mounted unit used in crowd control and things like that. And then there's the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. The whole province has a mounted unit as part of their constabulary. And I, this is now a total aside, but it's relevant to mounted police. Um, I met this gentleman, his wonderful horse, um, right here in the middle of Newfoundland, 20 miles from anywhere, there's a little restaurant, and we were eating in the restaurant, and this horse trailer pulled in, and these two got out, and I just, I had to go ask, what's going on? 
He was part of the mounted unit. This is entirely the wrong way round. Somehow I flipped that picture. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. So uh, somehow Newfoundland has just yeah. turned on its head. <laughs> but he'd gone all the way to this side of Newfoundland yeah. near Gross Morn to do a display and he was trucking his horse back to St. John's over here and he had to stop the obligatory stop every four hours to walk and water the horse to prevent injuring it. So I went out and chatted to him. And I, I didn't know much of this information that's on here, but I Googled it and I soon found it. And I found this lovely picture of him and his horse. And it was only after I'd looked at the picture for a few seconds that I read the caption. So there's the lovely picture. And there's the sad caption. Yeah, anyway, so apparently that beautiful horse died a few years after we were there. But mounted units are still around. Mounted units were part of developing Canada. We're getting there. Um, prairie farms had working horses. Look at the growth in the population, human population of Manitoba in a 10 year, 12 year, 11 year period. Farms were opening up all through Manitoba in the late 1800s. Each farm, as the people settled into them, got more horses. So there was a real explosion of horses on the prairies. Look at how much a pair of horses with harness would have cost in 1910, and that translates to about to that much now. So they were pretty expensive to buy, but boy, did you get your money back from them. I missed that. Um, as the ranchers moved west, they started importing horses from the prairies into the farms to become working animals. And Jim Gray Eyes was a a Cree, native Cree, who made a good living out of doing that, rounding up horses on the prairies, bringing them back to Manitoba and Saskatchewan to sell. And one day he rode out to a, a new settlement by some Dukabors from Russia, just newly arrived. They didn't speak uh, Cree and he didn't speak Russian. But as he got there, he saw this most amazing sight, and I, he must have laughed, because who wouldn't? There's a plow, plowing a field, ready to sow some crops, and it's not being pulled by an animal, it's being pulled by 20 young women, all strapped in harness, pulling this plough. So after he'd fallen off his horse laughing, he rode back and he came back the next day with four, harnesses, four horses in harness and showed the Dukabors how to use them. Came back in a week and the horses were sagging at the knees because the Dukabors had thought them so wonderful, they were working them 23 hours a day. So he angrily took those horses back, went back a week later with some more horses and a colleague, and left the colleague to show them how to use the horses. And that was the kind of interaction that was going on at the single farm level at that time. Um, number of horses per farm increases in the late 1800s, the number of farms increases. So there's a real boom in Western agriculture, but slowly but surely the farms get bigger because there's an economy of scale, but unfortunately the horses couldn't match that. If the farms get too big, you need too many horses to be able to work them. And this is one of the reasons for the eventual decline of horses, was the farms getting bigger. And here's another reason, machinery. In the late 1800s, the machinery is steam combines, steam um, steam-driven vehicles, which are fairly cumbersome. So they don't replace the horses immediately. In fact, even while the machines are around, those horses don't decline. <laughs> StatsCan has them declining rapidly, but they don't. They increase and then drop off slowly. So that in 1871, there's three times more horses in Canada than there are now. But, as I said, as the farms got bigger, the economy of scale worked against the horses. So now, while all production animals and crops have gone up by this, th these multiplication factors over this 120-year period, horse numbers have gone down. But it wasn't a, an abrupt transition, because here we have in 1922, here's the jobs being done by steam tractors, and here's the jobs in black being done by horses. So the heavy stuff's being done by the, the tractors, the vehicles, and everything else 
that requires a little more uh, maneuverability is being done by horses. So they work side by side, machines and horses side by side. But then the horses eventually meet a competitor they can't match, the internal combustion engine, because that all of a sudden makes vehicles very versatile and mobile. So here is a vehicle as a carriage, and here's a vehicle as a farm implement. It's the same vehicle. It's a Model T Ford. And here it is pulling a binder. And it probably could bind more hay in an hour, three times more hay in an hour than a horse could, pulling it. So that really started the death knell for the number of working horses. In other uses, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, but before 1914, Canada supplied many, many horses to Europe for mainly the British cavalry and the British army. In the First World War, some 200,000 horses were shipped from Canada to Europe. So that was quite an export. Here's our local content, John McRae and his fine animal, Bonfire. And here's the artillery picture I showed you before. Um, the First World War destroyed so many horses, these 200,000 from, from Canada, most of them would not have come back. And again, this is a bit of an aside, but this is a memorial in London, England, to animals in war. And here's two horses, a horse and a mule, bearing their load, as, as they did, taking things up to the front. But as they go through this mystical gate, whatever you want to call it, they shed their load and become the proud animals they once were. And that's a very emotional, moving memorial to all the animals that have died in war. So, the summary of the story is that pre-Confederation, the terrain was opened up largely by people on foot on water. Horses were confined to settlements. Once the prairies started being developed and the agricultural, agricultural parts of Ontario and Quebec, horses really came into their own in many, many working uses. They really were the engine that drove the development of Canada from just before Confederation to the early, 1900, early 1900s, which is when Canada was really coming into its own as a nation. Nowadays, you will still see working horses, especially if you drive up through the St. Jacobs area. Um, but they are much less common than they used to be. And horses now, there's still a million in Canada, are primarily used for sport and pleasure. So they are very much a part of the agricultural community in many parts of Canada, but very different uses. Um, I firmly believe, and there's evidence to support it, that after the 2008 economic slump in, in, uh, in uh, North America generally, but the agricultural industry of Ontario was spared a large part of that effect because of the effect of having horses. Con buying, people had to buy hay, they had to hire the veterinarians, and people with horses um, generally have money. The, the statement about horses now is if you want to make a large, sorry, a small fortune by having horses, you have to start off with a large fortune. All right. So a lot of money goes into horses in ways that hopefully are a lot more friendly than um, some of the working uses that have been used, that have been used for in the past. But have they been essential developing, to developing Canada? I think you'd agree, yes, they certainly have. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> and just to prove I didn't make this up, if you need references, there are some. And I'd really like to thank Kathleen Wall of this museum because she got, I asked her to get me some pictures at noon and she said, go find them yourself in the catalogue, give me the numbers. I gave her the numbers at four. She had the pictures back to me by 4.20. So she, yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Anyway, thank you very much.